So in the last video I asserted that when common expectation holds in Lewis's sense, then mutual expectation holds at every level. So if you commonly expect P among a group of people, then that group of people mutually expects P, they mutually expect that they mutually expect P, and so on. We saw that if that connection holds, then we can explain the counterexamples to the first definition of convention. However, I didn't say why that connection holds, and I want to in this video give you some more sense of why that is. This argument is more complicated than Lewis makes it look, and it looks already pretty complicated in the book. So we're going to try and walk through the steps slowly. In particular, I want to break down what is going on in the proof by focusing on a principle which I'm just going to call Principle T. Uh, I couldn't really think of a great name for it, so we'll just call it Principle T. And the reason why I call it T is because it's sort of like a transitivity property for any of you who know what that means. If you don't know what that means, don't worry, you don't need to. But we're going to focus on this thing that I call Principle T. And Principle T is a principle about indication. What it says is that if A indicates P to all of us, to everyone, I'm going to write the E as a subscript when I mean to everyone, and it indicates to everyone that everybody expects A, then it in turn indicates that everybody expects P. So if some situation indicates a particular proposition, and the situation indicates of itself that everybody expects it to be to obtain, then it indicates that P is mutually expected. So it gives you a way of turning indication about P into indication about mutual expectations of P. Or put differently, it gives you a way of going from a lower order to a higher order of expectation. And indeed, that's exactly the fact that's going to be crucial when we try to show why common expectation gives you expectation at every level. This ability, this principle gives you to go from one level of expectation to the next. So this is the principle we're going to focus on. For now, I'm just going to assert that this principle holds. Uh, I'll say something at the end of the video about why we should think it holds. But for now, I'm just going to tell you, assume that this holds, and we can show why there's this connection between common expectation and expectation at every level. So what we'll do is, for concreteness, let's focus on a particular situation. We'll take the situation that Lewis talks about in the book. So imagine you and I have met, we've been talking together, you must leave before our business is done, as he says. Uh, so you say you'll return to the same place tomorrow. So here we're going to take A, the thing that's going to do the indicating, to be just the situation that we're in. So A, we think of it as standing for state of affairs. The, the, the proposition that A holds is that we're in the situation that I've just described. And for P, well, I'll actually write M. I'll use the proposition M, and that will mean the proposition that we're going to meet tomorrow in the same place. Thinking about the situation that I've just described, here are a few things that seems plausible that hold there. First of all, it seems plausible that both of us have reason to expect that A holds. So remember, A is just a description of our situation. We're normal perce perceivers involved in the situation. It looks like we have both have good reason to think that A is the case. It is the case. We also have good reason to think it's the case. That's what our evidence supports. It also seems that the situation A indicates this proposition M about us meeting tomorrow. Why? Well, if you learned that that was the situation, you, one of the parties in this situation, you would come to expect that we were going to meet tomorrow. But that sort of just is what indication says. Remember, A indicates P just in case whenever you'd have good evidence for P whenever you had evidence for A. So we saw it looks like whenever if you were to learn you were in situation A, then you would assume M was going to hold. So it looks like A indicates M in the situation to all of us involved. Lastly, it looks like A indicates that everybody expects A to be the case. Or, in other words, A indicates that everybody has good reason to think that A is the case. So, not only is it the case that I'm a normal perceiver, but it looks like that's maybe a fact I know about myself, and it's a fact I know about you. I know we're both normal perceivers. So on that basis, it looks like I should conclude, well, given that we're both normal, this situation will give us reason to think that we're in that situation. So I expect both of us to expect that we're in A. So I just said three things hold in this situation. But if you go back now and look at what it means to, for something to be commonly expected, you'll see that actually, according to the definition, we now commonly expect M to be the case. Why? Because we both have reason to believe some state of affairs holds. That state of affairs indicates the proposition that M is true. And the state of affairs indicates that we have reason to expect that that situation itself holds. 
Remember, those were our three conditions for common expectation. It looks like those are met. So this is a situation where we commonly expect the proposition M that we're going to meet tomorrow. So we've established this situation meets the definition for common expectation. What we're going to do is show that because it meets the definition of common expectation, it's one where mutual expectation holds at every level. We're not really going to show it holds at every level, of course. We could do that if you are. If you're familiar with proofs by induction, you'll be able to see how to turn what I'm going to say into a proof by induction. But I'm just going to give you a few cases, enough cases to give you the sense of what's going on. So let's do the first level first. What we want to first show is that the proposition M is mutually expected. Everybody expects that we will meet tomorrow. Driving this is reasonably straightforward. We just got to write down some of the things that we know. So first thing we know is that A indicates M. Why do we think we know that? Well, because this situation as described, if you were to learn that you were in that situation, then that would give you good evidence to believe M. If you learned that the situation was as Lewis describes, you would conclude that we were going to meet tomorrow. And that's just what it is for the situation to indicate M. Moreover, we actually should believe that we're in A. We have good reason to think that we're in A. So we expect A. And as you see, I've written the, the definition of indication here. So A indicates P when we expect P whenever we expect A. And then if you put these two things together with the definition of indication, you'll see that it actually just follows uh, that we expect M. Because this is a conditional, this is the antecedent of that conditional, and this is the consequent of that conditional. So we've derived the first level expectation. We all expect M. Now let's look at the second level of expectation. The second level of expe expectation is that we all expect that we all expect M. This is where principle T is going to become, become in handy. Because the first thing we're going to do is we're going to show using principle T that the state of affairs A not only indicates M, but also indicates that everybody expects M. So why is that true? Well, remember again, we have A indicates M. We also, just by the description of the situation, saw that it looks like A indicates everybody expects A. Because it's the kind of situation which, if you're in it, given that you're a normal perceiver, you would think that everybody is aware, or everybody should be aware, that they're in A. So we have that A indicates that we expect A. But now compare these two to the antecedent of our principle T. And we see that they're exactly the right form to apply our principle. So here P is just M, and then this is exactly the same as the other premise. So if we apply these two to our principle T, we get the conclusion that A indicates that everybody expects P. Conclusion, using principle T, A indicates we expect M. So this just follows from principle T. But remember, we also said we have good reason to believe A. We expect A to be the case. And whenever you expect A, and A indica indicates P, then you should expect P. So here we have A indicates that we expect M, we expect A, so it just follows that we expect that we expect M. In other words, we've derived our second level mutual expectation. Not only do we expect M, as we showed in the previous step, we also expect that we expect it. The very last step I'm going to go through is showing that the third level expectation holds. The reason why it's good to see that the third level expectation holds is because it's, this is the step where you see the crucial move that will allow you to in principle see why it's going to hold at all levels. And basically the reason is that in the last step we derived a new indication. We derived that A indicates that we expect M. And in the next step for third level 
we plug in as a premise that indication that we derived in the last step. So to just say that again and make it a bit more concrete, here's something we derived in the last step, that A indicates we expect M. That was the crucial thing that we derived in the last step that allowed us to derive the second level expectation. But now what we're going to do is we're going to take that as a premise and we're just going to plug it in to this new principle. So this is one premise. We continue to have the premise that A indicates that we expect A. And what we do now is we apply the thing that we derived in the last step of the argument to the principle again, and we now let this be our P. So for P, last time we put M in for P, now we're putting in that we expect M for P, and the second premise remains unchanged. So if we apply these two things, letting P be the proposition that we expect M, what we derive is a new, even more complicated indication. We derive that A indicates we expect that we expect M. So with the, in, with the indication that we derived in the last step, we're able to derive a new indication about second level mutual expectations. And then, just as we did before, we can go from this to a premise about third level expectations. Because we said that when A indicates P, and you should expect A, then you should also expect P. So here we have that A indicates that we expect that we expect M, we should expect A, so then we should expect that this whole thing, namely we should have a third level expectation. I'll just quickly write that down. Expect, we expect, Okay, so this is obviously the point at which it gets too complicated to do any individual step for it really to be worth doing. So I just want to step back for a moment and comment on the general structure of what happened. Because what we did here is exactly what we would do in the next step. We derive this indication about a second level expectation just as we used an indication in the previous step as a premise in this step, we would use this as a premise of the next step. We would use this as a premise, we continue to assume this, we would apply principle T, and then we would derive an indication about a third level expectation. And then we would derive the fourth level expectation in the same way. And then you, see, you can just keep going. You just plug the results of the argument into itself and you keep generating these more and more complex expectations. And in fact, it's provable that in this kind of situation, you will have mutual expectation at every level. As I said, I'm not going to give you the nuts and bolts of the proof, but this will be enough, I hope, to show you why the proof should continue in this way. Because each step crucially relies on something that you proved in the previous step that you can then just plug into principle T. So I think this is a little bit more illuminating than, than Lewis's original presentation, because Lewis's presentation doesn't really make explicit this principle T. But once you have this principle T, that really brings out how you just derive something at one step that you use as a premise in the next step, that you use in the next step, and so on. Uh, each step feeds into the next step very naturally once you have this principle T. But the obvious question is, well, why should we think this holds? Why should we think that when A indicates P, and A indicates everybody expects A, then A expects that everybody expects P? Obviously the lecture's gone on quite long by this stage, so I'm not going to give you the proof of this, but I am going to tell you that it's possible to prove that this holds, but you have to make some assumptions, and some assumptions that Lewis is not actually super straight up about. In fact, there are three assumptions. The first assumption is that we expect that the state of affairs indicates the same thing to everybody in the situation. So for instance, if in this state of affairs, A indicates that it's raining to me, then it indicates it's raining to you, or at least that's what I expect. I expect that the state of affairs indicates the same, all the same things to all of us. And in fact, we all expect that. The second assumption is that you have reason to believe P, just in case you have reason to believe that you have reason to believe P. This is what's called an iteration principle. It's called iteration because you can 
you can what's called iterate the operators. You can stick putting you have reason to believe twice in front of p is the same as just putting it in front once. And the final principle he relies on is that when a indicates that p, then you have reason to believe a indicates p. Or when a indicates p, you expect it indicates p. So indication says there's an evidential connection between two things, that when you have evidence for one, you have evidence for another. This premise says that whenever an evidential connection holds, you have reason to believe that evidential connection holds. So your evidence always tells you what evidential connections hold. These three assumptions are kind of fall into two different categories. The, the second two are quite distinct from the first one. The first one is just a contingent one. Basically, to say that we expect we all expect that a state of affairs indicates the same thing to all of us, that's really just saying that we all have the same backgrounds and same standards of weighing evidence. It's saying that I should think there's an a evidential connection between A and P, just in case you have an evidential connection between A and P. But whether an evidential connection holds is something that depends on our standards and, and what kind of evidence we have. So as long as that contingent feature of the case holds, as long as it is in fact true that we have all the same standards and we have all the same kind of background evidence, and that we know that, then that assumption will be met. But importantly, when we don't, that's going to be a barrier to having coming an expectation. The other two assumptions are much more general. They're more general epistemological assumptions. They're assumptions about what you might call the logic of what it is to have reason to believe something. These connections are actually kind of strong, um, and we're going to see in a few weeks that some people reject them. The thing I want to highlight for now is that this principle T, which we saw was really crucial in getting the argument from common expectation to expectation at all levels going, relies on a few background assumptions that are not being made explicit. And some of those assumptions are epistemological ones that people actually turn out to have reason to reject. We'll see why exactly in a few weeks people reject those. The main takeaway I want you to have is that this way of thinking about expectation is relying on some epistemological assumptions to do the work that Lewis wants it to do.